right. So hi everyone, it's Twani Price, owner of Zuri Wine Tasting and host of Abroad Drinking Wine. I am talking today to a winemaker who's originally from Zimbabwe, lived in South Africa, and now he lives in New Zealand. He's an all around amazing guy. Um, I think he started off with the sommelier route and then he went into the winemaking route. That's just my, my guesstimation from my research, but we will find out. We are here with Kishe, Kis, Kashias Gumbo. I practiced his name and I said it perfectly before that. So Kashias Gumbo, um, he is calling in from New Zealand right now. So Kashias, first of all, can you tell us what time is it in New Zealand? Uh, we are just um, past 10 a.m. So about 10 minutes past 10 a.m. So we are actually ready to work. Very too early for a glass of wine, of course. <laughs> 10 a.m. on a Friday, right? And a right Friday, now yes. it's 11 p.m. in South Africa, where I am, and where most of my audience is in LA. I think it's about 10 in the morning there. So, like, we are all over the place mm. with our time zones. And I'm not yeah. drinking wine, I'm drinking iced tea. Just because I try not to drink wine during the week because um, I drink a lot and that would be too much. Yeah. All right. So thanks so much for calling in. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, like I said, I wanted to record this for a broad drinking wine. And then I also am doing some research for a blog that I'm writing on New Zealand wine. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the New Zealand wine culture, about the winemaking, like what's going on in New Zealand. So Cassius, can you first tell us a little bit about yourself, like a brief summary of who you are, how you ended up in New Zealand? Oh, yeah, it's... um. It's, um, it's a long story, but um, a fantastic story to unpack as well. Uh, obviously, obviously, it goes without saying that um, uh, a culture of wine, it's not for my forefathers. It was never been for my forefathers. So this is sort of like a new territory in as far as um, my people are concerned. And um, growing up in a Christian family, a wine is something that you do not partake in. And um, obviously, when I moved to South Africa, it became clear that there was something I have never learned. And it was so fascinating to see how people flock in restaurants and bars just to hold a glass of wine. It was sexy in some sense. Yes, <laughs> so. that's how I felt when I first started. I was like, wait, people like really gravitate towards this and it's super sexy. I need to be a part of this world. Yeah, so I totally yeah. can relate to that. So that's how you started, like when you were in South Africa and you saw that going on, that's when you kind of, that's when your interest in wine peaked? Absolutely, so that's, uh, that's when I started to get an interest. But then the experience of having your first sip for me wasn't that... Uh, uh, something I expected and that wasn't something I thought I would end up being part of it because it wasn't pleasant. So like every newcomer will come to have a fancy glass of wine. If the wine is not sweet, you don't want to go back there. Right. So, but of interest to me was then to find out, I quickly learned wine came from grapes and believe it or not, by then I didn't even know where wine came from. So... Um, and learning that the wine come from grapes, I could only relate to grapes as foliage in our house, but not as something you can use to make beverage. Right. So that was so fascinating. And I thought, oh, this is quite interesting to learn really. And obviously what followed after that was just immense studying through the local colleges and through the international schools, just to make sure that I am better equipped in this, um, new venture and saving wine in a restaurant and when you don't know it it just makes life very very difficult so i had to make sure i wanted to make sure that i know what i'm talking about and you've worked at some of the best restaurants in south africa like the oyster box right and is it durban or quasi natal or no actually not not in i'm uh, not in, in durban um my first um experience in a restaurant was in ready castile so oh. um, yeah, so in uh, in the Swatland, so um, I kind of like my friends treat me as a as a as a forefather as well. That's when I started, and then that's when I met some of um, that's when they are my family. Some of the interesting and really successful um, 
uh, wine sommeliers in South Africa at the moment, uh, I have said this to you, Tony, before, maybe years ago, that all of those guys slept in my living room when they moved to South Africa. And all we could talk about was Oh, but wine. you look so you look so young. And you see the people <laughs> in your living room, like you look like a baby. So I can I it, that's hard to believe, but wow. So like people were talking about the likes of like Joseph Dafra Dafra? Uh, Tafana, yeah, you, we we spotted that. It's funny stuff. First stuff, and there's some gonna be. I don't not to put him down, but this is really a cool story, and I'm sure it's going to be um, learned by many from the documentary when it's released. Is that we spotted Tongai Jafana on television when he was um, as a refugee in Jobek, and because we knew him back from back home, then we called him. He he contacted us a few days later and said. I'm in Jobe. I said, yes, we saw you on television. And I said, we're struggling. I said, then come to my house. So they had to spend two days in the train coming to Cape Town where they come and stayed with us. And then we found him a job in a restaurant where I was working. But then the conversation really was then starting to say, what is this thing called wine? And, I love that story. I and we started story. doing wine. Yeah, yeah. Community, like, yes. Yeah. So then I, again, this is this is a, like I said, it's a good story, and people need to hear it. It's um, all of these guys now who are top sommeliers in the country came from the same uh, kind of like story. We now we're talking about Tongai being Joseph being the head sommelier for Lacolom. So when I left Lacolom to go to work in Santon in Jobek at the Saxon, I tapped on the shoulder and said, "Come fill up my position," and then he came and took over. But I also did my my first stint of volunteering sommelier at a um, roundhouse mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Kemp's Bay, and then uh, went for La Colombe as a sommelier. Um, also doubling with the um, wine sales, just to understand trade at the wine concepts. Um, but uh, yeah, and then during that time, that was just more studying and more mentoring other people. Now I'm so excited to know that jo Job Jobo, who also kind of had the same story, is now the head sommelier at um, the Oyster Box. Uh, we know the Tawanda Marume, the current um, Zimbabwean best sommelier. We, they are all like sort of my brothers and we, we did wines together. So I kind of feel like, uh, yeah, I'm a grandfather, you're right. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so that, yeah. that is such an amazing story. And like I said, I can't get over the fact that you're a grandfather because you look like the great grandson. <laughs> Um, so then, like, let's fast forward a little bit. So, like, life is going well. Your song life is popping in Cape Town. And then you leave Cape Town, which is beautiful, to go to New Zealand, which I've never been to New Zealand, but I hear that it's beautiful as well. And it happens to be COVID-free at the moment. Um, yeah. So how did you end up in New Zealand? So it's a fun story and quite interesting as well, because um, then, but I left it. I kept town to Jobek to work at the Saxon. And Saxon was a very a good establishment, a lot of opportunities. I had the chance to meet some of the world leaders. Oh, funny. I, I met Oprah Winfrey. I saved the tea, saved the tea to Oprah Winfrey. Um, I met lots of um, wait, wait, top musicians. Wait, wait, you have to back up before this Oprah Winfrey. Did you say you sent her tea? She wasn't drinking wine? She wasn't drinking wine. <laughs> That's what I was going to know. Like, what wine did Oprah drink? What did she order? But she was drinking tea. Okay, do you remember the flavor? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, it was, um, we had some special, special uh, South African tea, sort of like um, um, the likes of rooibos and stuff. She was more into these um, um, organic uh, tea, special teas. And the Saxon, being the Saxon, he had some amazing products. And, but this is years ago now, so I kind of my, lost my train. But yeah, but um, yeah, she was drinking tea. I was so excited to save your wine. I was like, this is where you show off what you can do to saving some of the uh, influential black people in. And then she, she drank tea. That was a disappointment for so many of it. It was good. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. So, yeah, and um, obviously being the Saxon and like you, you would know by now that um, it attracts all the top um, uh, people of influence. And I had the chance I met, I met um, the current president, sitting president of South Africa. I saved him some wine that was interesting. And I always see him on television and I'm like, oh, wait, I saw this guy. I should be. And he's a fantastic, nice, uh, fantastic man. So very kind and he's got a big heart. 
uh, yeah, I can talk a lot about celebrities and all them, but uh, <laughs> that's then I, I started traveling. I had opportunities to travel through the Saxon. And I remember my first trip to one, I went overseas and I came back with change from the money they gave me to spend. And the managing director said, what is that? I said, it's change. And he said, did you bring your wife anything? I said, no, I couldn't use work money. He said, are you crazy? When you give you money, that's your money. You are away from your family. Imagine You're doing wine. Buy it. Change. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh, that's when you buy your wife a dress. For me, that was something that was like, whoa, with the work money. So it was a lot present. I was presented with a lot of opportunities, and it was just endless. Uh, they would Where sponsor me to go and judge me. Too. Where did you go when you went overseas? Oh, I went to France, I went to Austria, I went to the UK. I, I frequent the UK judging wines mm -hmm. and the Saxon paid for it. That was amazing. As you know, you don't get paid for judging, but it's the opportunities and the exposure you get to go and taste wines. It's a sommelier, it's a to die for. So even working for the Saxon and they were funding that, they encouraged me to do that. It was a great opportunity and I think that you helped to build my career. And... Um, an opportunity to come and do an exam in New Zealand for the sommelier through the Court of Masters arrived. And uh, the Saxon said, yes, you go. I took a one month holiday and I had to do some tours in New Zealand as well. And I uh, went to after the examination, second day in New Zealand, I uh, wrote my exam, I passed. And um, the, the master sommelier in New Zealand said, are you going back to Africa? I said, yeah, I'm on holiday. I've got 30 days to go. He said, there's a hotel, one of the top hotels in New Zealand, pretty much the same standard as the Saxon, but in New Zealand standards, and they're looking for a sommelier. I said, oh, I'm, I'm working in South Africa, but I would like to have the opportunity to do some shifts there. And when I got there, I called them. They said, come over. They knew the Saxon as well, and they've read my profile somehow. And I, I came over just to meet the food and beverage manager and they offered me a job. It was very hard to say no. And, wow, um, wow. So yeah, they offered you a job and were you like, what were you thinking at that time? Were you thinking like, this is surreal? Were you thinking like, um, hell yeah, this is what I deserve. This is what I've been working for. What, what was your thought process? I think I was, um, yeah, I think I was just brought up in a way that I was taught to always be humble. Mm -hmm. I did not realize, at the moment, I did not realize the impact I had in the wine industry. Right. I was just thinking, I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, I need to be better. If I'm not better, somebody will be better. So I just have been working just, frankly, as just any other person and being not, not wanting to be too big for my shoes. And when they told me this, and they, I told them that I have a good job. I really have a good job. I earn a good money. And they said, we can make that better. Ah. I, I couldn't believe that. <laughs> I couldn't believe that to say, <laughs> to say wow. this is actually happening. And uh, again, because of where I come from, I felt like I was going to be a disappointment to the people that have trusted me and sent me around the world. And uh, then feeling guilty about myself, I felt like, oh, and then something knocked in my head and said, I deserve this, you're right. And, uh, I, and I said, either ways, I am going to leave the Saxon at some stage. It yeah. just depends when I'm going to leave it. And right. then I, I decided, I'll give it a trial for a month. I'm on holiday anyway. And if it works, I will then resign. If it doesn't work, I'll still go back. I would have any money. And then uh, two weeks in, it was just incredible. I entered for this New Zealand sommeliers competition uh, without knowing all other deeds about New Zealand uh, liquor industry, beers and stuff. I placed the first in the wine testing category. Uh, I, couldn't, I didn't do well in the theory, but I was in the top four of New Zealand sommeliers two weeks in. And that was like, everybody winemakers started coming to come and see me to say there's this african guy who is in new zealand is incredible we here i think that motivated me to say you know what this is gonna be home <laughs> wow that yeah, yeah. is such an amazing story that's such a story of like you know i mean i definitely believe in god leading us to paths and like you know, putting us where we're supposed to be, even though we yeah. have no idea what the plan is. I feel like we could try to plan all we want to, but God's like, nah, this is your plan. This is, this is it. 
Wow. It's so true. do you have any regrets at all about that decision or like? I think I, for, for years I've been regretting it because I felt like I was a disappointment to the to the company that um, allowed me to see the international uh, arena of wines. But then I have, since I have passed that and realized that this was meant to happen either way, whether I liked it or not, yeah. whether the company I worked for liked it or not, this was, des this was my destiny and it was going to happen. And I'm very happy and I'm glad of what I've achieved in that time and what I'm doing now. I have opened some great opportunities for myself and for my family. And I have changed the sort of like the, um, the picture of what the wine industry is about and yeah. the opportunities. I have inspired many, many, some of the people that text me from South Africa at the moment, I don't even know them. I've never met them. And they still tell me that my story inspires them. Some of them, I, I can't put the face to their name, but I, have, I always know that even when you're up there, you can come down. So make sure that you talk to the people at the bottom because you don't know where you're impacting. Yeah, you and, never know uh, who I have to sleep on one day. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of like, um, I kind of like always talk to them and inspire them, motivate them, give them direction. And sometimes even introduce them to the people that can help them who are on the ground because, as you know, I'm very far and I haven't been in South Africa for years. I have lost some contacts and um, I've lost some influence, but um, I always direct them to my, uh, to the likes of uh, Joseph, to the likes of Tinashe, to the likes of Tawanda. I've always directed them into the right direction and they always have got help because they are coming from me is introducing them so they really appreciate that and yeah it's it's um so it's when, been a, uh, when exactly did you transition from okay this superstar rock star samaye to becoming a winemaker because you do have your own wine brand you produce wine in new zealand and so like when did you make that transition from the psalm to the winemaker I'll tell you what happens. Everything I, from a, from a young age, I always have wanted to be uh, a change maker in the in the in Zimbabwe. As you know, uh, I always tell people that uh, I wanted to be the president of Zimbabwe, but Mugabe never left, so I had to leave. <laughs> so so um, I always have wanted to understand politics. So I decided to while I was working as a song, I decided to go to university to study politics. And as I was doing that, it, of course, the balancing part of it became quite harder. Work, some work, you start in the evening and I could go to the university and study, but then you don't have enough time, enough balance. So I figured it out that the best thing for me to do is to have my own, my own company. So I started working with one of the importers in, um, of South African wines in New Zealand. I didn't want to start from scratch because I could have made contact with some uh, wine producers in South Africa and import their wines, but I felt like there was no point. I could use less capital and still uh, make the same margins. But this importer works mostly in Auckland, which is the North Island of New Zealand. So I contacted him as, and I said, all I know is South African wines and um, not being racist and I'm black and wines come from South Africa. So I felt like I would offer true representation of South African wines in New Zealand because I'll be talking something, it's not a told story, it's what I lived. So I contacted him and I said, I would sell your wines in South Island for a commission or for a margin. He agreed, he thought it was the right and appropriate thing to do. So I started moving around during the day with a big portfolio of South African wines and it doesn't take a genius to know that I'm African. So talking about the products, that's where I come from, was easy. it was a success. I really did very well. And um, from there, I raised the money to start a wine brand. So in seeking to make a wine brand, I ran into a, a, another winemaker because that's what happens in this industry. You make a lot of good friends. We had just bought his own um, piece of land with vines, organics, uh, a converted vineyard. So I said, what are you going to do with the grapes? He said, I will sell the grapes because I don't have any money to put in winemaking since I just bought it. So I said, I will buy all the grapes from my vineyard. So, and then that's how the uh, agreement started. And then two weeks later, he came back to me and said, I want to be part of that. If I'm going to farm these grapes, 
why don't you do a business partnership? And then I look after the grapes. You don't put money in this, in this winemaking. We only put money when my wine is sold because I'm feeding the grapes. You do the marketing. It was so lucrative deal. And um, we did all the things that needed to be done. And uh, we made our first wine in 2016 and the brand was born. And it's hey, been growing the incredible. The of the brand? So we, we toiled around a lot of different names and we realized there was nothing that attracts us to these fancy names we can pick around. So we just ended up saying, what represent what we want this wine to represent is our families and our um, heritage and our coming together and i would tell you there is no any other gumbo gumbo in new zealand except me so this is a start of a new era and we decided to call it our family name it's called gumbo and my friend is called good so we just said it's called gumbo and good families wines i mean so to say gumbo and good and good Oh, G-O-O-T or G-O? G-O-O-D. Oh, good. Gumbo and good. Yeah. You know what those yeah. Gum In America, gumbo is this delicious, like, soup um, or stew, like, with seafood, like, soup. That's what gumbo is, and it's so delicious. So gumbo and good, I can imagine that that would do amazingly well in the southern part of the United States, especially New Orleans, like, gumbo and good. And was the first wine that you guys produced, was it um, a Sauvignon Blanc? That's correct, yeah. Yes. So we, we, yeah. <laughs> so we, we, you're right that um, uh, the term gumbo, while it's for me and my family, it means our family name. For everybody else there, they translate it into the, into the, to, to the New Orleans uh, gumbo soup. Yeah. And people find it, when, you do, when I do trade shows, we have a line of people really saying, that's where the catchy name, we just wanna come and try this. And when I tell them the story, it just creates a good story. And um, for, their, for everybody else, they just wanna be part of it. They think it's a fantastic story. And while it's, but what I, attract them first is the term to say, who would call their wine gumbo? Yeah, so, gumbo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and good, gumbo and good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And some even if some even uh, mute the, the the end, they just say gumbo good, <laughs> and it's funny. And uh, but yeah, it's good. It's doing very well. Uh, we we have um, grown from just making two pallets of wine into now making ten to twenty of each variety. So uh, before COVID, we had opened a lot of international markets. Uh, Korea and uh, Japan has been doing amazing with our wines. So yeah, it's a growing brand. Nice. And so what other varietals do you guys produce besides the Sauvignon Blanc? Oh, we do Sauvignon Blanc, we do Pinot Gris, and we do our Pinot Noir. We, um, with 2021 vintage, we are looking to start to diversify into other grapes like Muscat, because we have a fantastic block of Muscat. We're going to let it go dry and make a late harvest. We've got some Gavustramina as well. We've got some Chardonnay. But the big, uh, bigger picture at the moment is to make those, to add those, the dessert wine and also do an Alsatian blend because we've got the varieties, the Alsatian uh, varieties, so. Nice. And, yeah. oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I have so many questions. So you're on the South Island then, right? Yeah. So I've been studying New Zealand, so I should know this, but Marlboro is on the South Island, right? Yes, Marlboro is on the South Island, but it's in the north of the South Island. So mm -hmm. before you break, uh, before you get to the sea that separates, that corridor that separates the north and the south. But so the top of the south, that's where Marlboro is. And where's your venue? I'm four hours away drive here. Yeah. Okay, and what's the area called? Uh, it's, just, it's just called Marlboro. No, Marlboro the area that, weekend. it's called what? You mean the area that's... The area that your in. Oh, my, our vineyard is in an area called the Wipra. It's since changing name now to call, we want to call it North Canterbury. Okay, North Canterbury. Yeah, so, so we kind of like uh, think, think of it as um, the Swatland of South Africa. Okay. So we know when the, when the Swatland region started to put themselves on the map and doing things right, people didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And they had to make sure that the world know that Swatland is a very good wine region. That's what we're doing right now uh, with the North Canterbury. We've changed it from Wipra because it didn't stand out for 
exactly what we do and where some of our vineyards who practices the best practices we do in the in Wipra are further north out of uh, Canterbury. So we're trying to accommodate everybody. So all these wines, they are going to change now to be called North Canterbury. So we just, I'm sure old books won't change, but new books will change. <laughs> nice. North Canterbury. Yeah. Okay, so I will keep that yeah, in yeah. mind. And then so, yeah. what's, the, what's the weather conditions like in that region, in North Canterbury? Um, is it warm? Because you said it was like the Swatland. So it's kind of like the same microclimate. Is it warm? Is it hot? It is, it is sort of like, um, if you look at a uh, Marlboro being the very cold mm -hmm. and then you come because you're coming down further south you're moving four or four hours away from the cooler uh, breezy climate and our vines experience a bit more warmer um, mm -hmm. conditions uh, but this is just on sort of like in central on the central of uh, the south island before you get to the coldest the south island mm -hmm. the, the central otago so we 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 make so think it of um is Pinot Gris in, um, in Marlboro being very crisp, fresh, and really high in acid. And then you come to North Canterbury where the Pinot Gris is a bit more oily and rich textured. So a bit more, ex we experience during harvest a bit more warmer, um, uh, warmer days. So we get to a higher, uh, get that rich phenolic ripeness. So we kind of like make sort of like a full body, richer white wines. So we, I would say we are both, we, we're not as hot as Swatland, but we're not as cold as Marlboro. Okay. And then yeah. what about, oh, do you guys, is it stainless steel 100% for your Sauvignon Blanc? Or do you guys add any oak to it? Or? Uh, as, a, as a producer ourselves, we, we, we use the stainless steel and bottles, oak bottles. So all my wines have to go through a regime of uh, bottle fermentation, uh, including my Sauvignon Blanc. And um, uh, Pinot Gris, just, we just use a neutral oak. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm coming from a perspective of a wine I want to drink when I'm having food as a sommelier. So I, always, I wanna make wines that I want to drink. So we do a lot, uh, we use a lot of, lot of neutral oak and a lot of, um, if, a little of stainless steel, uh, very little. Yeah. Very little. So even when you do the initial fermentation, the initial fermentation is done in neutral oak barrels for the sodium, yes, yeah. for example. Yeah. Wow. So, but I mean, this is, we're talking about 20% of the whole, the whole, uh, the whole pro produce anyway. So we do part of it and then we and then later um, um, transfer it. But also because the reason I did that is because I wanted all my Sauvignon Blanc to go through uh, a little bit about 15% mallow. Mm -hmm. which is hardly happening in, um, in, uh, in, in Sauvignon Blanc. Yes. And that alone has made our wines to have a signature and identity because people are tired of Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc that is very crispy, acidic, grassy, gooseberry. It's, you can get it anywhere. I mean, and, you know what, um, for me, I love it because it's, uh, and you know what, I love it because it, that's their identity, right? And so like, I love yeah. that if you're in um, Northern Canterbury, then you're creating your own identity. You're not saying, okay, let's make wine like they make in Marlboro. You're saying, you know what, yeah. let's give it our own style, our own characteristics. So like when you have this Sauvignon Blanc, you can identify that it comes from Northern Canterbury, or you can say, you know what, this one comes from um, Marlboro. So I like that because I love Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc for that reason, because it's so distinctive. Because if I taste it in a blind tasting, that's probably the only wine in the world that I can guess the grape varietal and the region. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's even my, even our wines, you, you will get the traces that it is Sauvignon Blanc. You get that gooseberry. Mm -hmm. um, you get that riper gooseberry. But then you, it was, I, I think there is um, an image issue you you a uh, wine tester you you probably test some great wines and you taste them for a purpose then you get a consumer who just drinks wine yeah. and they have shifted we've seen a big shift from sauvignon blanc because they felt sauvignon blanc was just this cheap uh, shite wine and we don't you don't want to like drink that like there there are stereotypes like oh it can't a yeah. like when you get when you 
yeah, it can't age, it's high in acidity, it's like for a summer's day, you don't pay more than, you know, in America, you don't pay more than $13 a bottle for a Sauvignon Blanc, yeah. you know what I mean? It has that reputation. But I have tasted some really amazing, like, well-made Sauvignon Blancs that, you know, people have used oak or, you know, they've used, you know, natural yeast and things like that, so they have different characteristics. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's where, we, that's where we, we, we're doing, that's exactly what we're doing. We we, want to, we don't want Sauvignon Blanc to be boring anymore. The, the time is up. And uh, I had a chance to talk to be um, spending time with some of the top wine makers, like um, uh, the guy who made um, Cloudy Bay, Cloudy Bay, really, go international. His name is called Kevin Judd. He makes his own brand now called the Grey Wacky Wines. If you get a chance, try them. It, it will change your perspective on Sauvignon Blanc. The uh, use of natural yeast, the use of uh, the taking Sauvignon Blanc an extra step further and doing a malolactic fermentation is just change the dimension of wines, making them more interesting, uh, making all this glass of wine age longer. Because my wine Sauvignon Blanc on the market currently with 2018, and we I ate some wine uh, mass of wines testing my wine and said we thought this was gone. It's incredible. It's gonna drink in 2025. Yeah. So those are the feedback that feed our ego, is uh, to say, we're doing the right thing. And all these people doing that, we can start to see a lot of winemakers now moving, going to accepting and appreciate their terroir. Use those natural yeasts you get in the vineyard to kickstart your fermentation. And then you get character, you get identity. And that's, um, that's what fascinates us. And we keep doing what we do. I love it. Oh my goodness. I could talk to you for hours and hours and I know we don't have hours and hours. We only have about 15 minutes. Yeah. But I just wanted to know, like, I, I love it that you talked about how like you, you like to make your wine so that it goes well with food. And I guess I kind of want to talk a little bit about how your background as a sommelier helps you as a brand owner for wine. Do you think that, I mean, obviously you think that it's um, beneficial because when you're making the wine, you can say, you know what, I know what people like. I know what people like to drink with food. Um, how, how do you work that into more of your wine making techniques or your wine decisions, like your background? I think I think, I think I, um, during blending, of course, that's where everything starts. Because if I will not be able to drink that one myself, I don't want to make it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just maybe a word of advice for, because you're going to probably have a lot of your audience watching this, is sommeliers as well. It's what you learn in that sommelier class and all those testings you do to an I watch, I follow that. I don't know the time sometimes the time difference is different is hard to what to, to follow but all that experience you are getting as a song you are going to need those skills to sell wine in the future because it's going to come a time when you say i not, can no longer be on the floor and this is where i see my sommelier skills really come into play because you know how to navigate all levels of knowledge uh, you come across on um, in people and um, expertise and you can address a novice, you can address an expert and that your helps to sell your wine because you are authentic, you are well informed, you are original, you don't use those big terms because I can tell you if I'm learning wine and you tell me this is a third, fourth fill bottles and it's, this is oak <laughs> from uh, Bolimozin from the, I don't care that stuff. Yeah. I want to know what is the wine. And all those classes you do of teaching people how to test as a professional, to understand the nuances of wine and leading them to, to just, is this palatable for such a person? It's important for that. That's, this just gives you, the sommelier gives you the, uh, that ability to read your audience. Yes. To be able to give them information they require than everything you have learned during your sommelier uh, career. Yeah, and I think that it's important to, like, you know, as a psalm, you know, people might not care that it's third, fourth. They don't even know what that means, right? But you can say yeah, to yeah. them, oh, it's new oak, which means it's going to impart a lot of flavor, you know what I mean? Or it's an oak barrel that they used a few times. Like, so I love the combination of being a psalm and being able to take the knowledge that you have. And, you know, if you're talking to a winemaker and the winemaker is telling you third, fourth barrels um, are toast, 
you know, medium or heavy. Yeah. <laughs> you can talk to a winemaker and you can understand that. But then I feel like as a psalm or as a wine professional, your job is to take whatever that winemaker is saying when he's nerdy now yep. and to yep. reword it so that the common person understands it and understands what they're drinking in the glass. So absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's probably one. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about South, I mean, South African, New Zealand wine culture. So like the culture of New Zealand and winemaking there, like what's the vibe like? Like, um, is it collaborative? Is it experimental? Um, do they try to model themselves after a certain region? Or do you think that in New Zealand, they're just trying to, you know, create their own identity? I think it's, um, New Zealand has been, um, um, I think if you, like I said, you watch the North Canterbury movement, it's going to be changing the wine industry completely of New Zealand. At the moment, it's too traditional. Um, uh, it's, um, the people don't change yens quickly and um, it's uh, what my fathers did. I'm going to do the same thing for generations to generations. So the wine uh, industry itself is not changing the way it should be. But we have got other challenges globally, which we cannot resist. There's climate change. If we do not go break the uh, glass ceiling and start to grow Shiraz in Osira in Marlborough, we're wasting time. Because the, it's no longer just gonna, we, because we're gonna start producing Sauvignon Blanc from Central Otago in the coming 15, 20 years. So you know, we need to start thinking those things. I have that question all the time. Like I'm always like the classification of when is it 1855? Like how is that relevant with climate change? You know what I mean? How can you say that this area in France makes the same delicious wine that it did 200 years ago with climate change, you know? Um, so I always wonder about that. That's always my question is like, you know, when people are doing the same thing the same way for so long, how, how can they, how are they competing with the changes of the world? Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's just like we, 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 we're in denial. And um, like I said, the uh, North Canterbury movement, for us, it's, we, we do know, we do notice this, that things are no longer the same. It cannot be uh, business as usual. And uh, the expectation that you expect Marlboro wine or uh, North Canterbury wine to taste this, and if it doesn't taste like that, it, you discard it. Things need to change because what you are getting from North Canterbury is what we, the soils and the climate is giving us. We don't wanna manipulate wines to make sure that they tasted, they tasted 50 years ago. So we being really true to our uh, region, we really true to ourselves. We really want to start that regime to say, if wine uh, from Marlboro is tasting the same as wine from um, uh, Martinborough, then why should I change my wine supplier? I may as well still going to the same one because they all make the same wines. So that's where we're going. And uh, it's, it's gonna take time. Um, and when, I remember when we started seeing orange wines in New Zealand, this is not too long ago. I used to sell them in a restaurant and people like, oh, I can't drink that. It's interesting now that the same people that were not were saying that I meet them at wine tastings and that's become their favorite wines. Uh -huh. it's, just, it's just like a culture and we very change is hard, but it has to be, it's necessary. And this is what we're doing. We know you don't expect to not count a wine to taste like that. That's the change and it's necessary and it's gonna keep on changing. Unfortunately, if you stay behind, you will be left because we're not going backwards. So. No, never, right? And I have one more <laughs> yeah. question about the New Zealand wine industry. Would you say that it's more um, like corporate wine brands, vineyards, brand vineyards, or would you say that it's more small boutique family owned vineyards? Like, what would you say the ratio to that is? Uh, it's still more driven by corporate. Um, we're starting to see more families really paying attention and really modeling these to make sure that they leave a, a legacy. But it's more, still more corporate driven at the moment and that's need to change. But and so with the, um, the laws, the New Zealand um, laws changing the wine, in the wine industry, it's kind of like trying to keep the corporates out, um, at, at watch, but they still exist. It's still a, a, a market for the bigger guy. So what about Small guys? The, what about the New Zealand like laws? Do they are is it is it a very restrictive, heavy regulated industry? The wine industry there. Um, 
Are there yeah, it's, 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 it is regulated on the book, but the checks and balances are, are weak. Mm -hmm. um, here and there, you see a wine company getting sued or charged for, for importing Australian juice and labeling it in New Zealand. We just had a case like that. So, because it's cheaper. Um, and, but it's so, and if they've been caught now and the company has been in existence for the past 40 years, so they have been not been caught for 40 years, pretty much. Yeah, so so the, the laws are there in the book. <laughs> people they're drinking New Zealand juice and it's really Australian. So you said something yeah. that's very interesting. You said that because Australian um, juice is cheaper, right? So is the juice cost in New Zealand, um, is it in particularly high compared to other places in the world? And why? It, 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 it is high. It's... Uh, it's um, yeah, and like I said, uh, let me put it this way, like, after living in Johannesburg, money moves faster in Johannesburg, money moves faster, changes hands quicker in South Africa, you probably would tell, people spend money, mm -hmm. people don't spend money in New Zealand. So I think uh, those with money always have got money, so they control what happens. But I think we cannot afford, uh, we do have a farm which I work for in Central Otago. We make a lot of, get a lot of central tag opinion on. But the cost of producing that, we cannot compete with um, uh, New Zealand, Australian juice. The same per liter. We sell a, a liter of Pinot Noir for $10.50. Australian would come and offer you for $3.50. Wow. So it's just something in, in New Zealand, the, our cost of production, maybe because we are too isolated mm -hmm. and um, we, we don't, yeah, we don't, there is not, we can't keep on growing vines, whereas other countries, because they are big in um, an uh, area, they can keep on having more vine. That means more fruit, that means more juice around to go around and sell. So New Zealand is just, just too small for that. So the prices of wine keeps on at some level. They can only increase, they don't go down. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, we would like to see them go down, but um, yeah, it's unfortunately they keep on going up. <laughs> well, yeah, and I always think that the prices, because it's such a small, it's like an island, right? And I would imagine that you guys don't have, like, in South Africa, I mean, I hate to say it like this, but in South Africa, the cost of wine can be a little bit lower because they have labor that isn't as expensive, right? So they have yeah, a lot yeah. of immigrant labor, um, people who come in, just come to the country just for harvest season, right? I wouldn't imagine yeah. that anybody's going to New, or I mean, to New Zealand just for harvest season like you know it's an island yeah for us to get harvesters we get some people to come in the us with harvest we have to from uh, neighboring pacific nations like vanuatu fiji uh tonga so think of having going to go and take those harvesters and you have to put them somewhere to stay yeah and all those, those are all costs and they add up to the wine so to, like, of the day, they translate. from here to there you know what i mean yeah yeah. yeah so and so and yeah so we are almost done i have time for one more question and i just yeah. had this question that i thought i wanted to ask um if you just had to sum it up and you had to say like what makes new zealand wine so special like why why new zealand wine over any other wine in the world what would you say uh, i'll say i'll say there's a lot of um undiscovered a wine in New Zealand, from New Zealand, by the world. So we, 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 we just suffered, I think New Zealand uh, wine suffered an, um, an image uh, issue in the past, where everything was exported in bulk and sent to the UK, sent to the US, mm -hmm. bottled there to cut the cost and it becomes cheaper. And uh, with that, the world has never been offered an opportunity to experience proper New Zealand wines. So what makes it unique is the best wines of New Zealand are in New Zealand. Nice. And, um, and, um, so we have to have this to New Zealand to taste these wines. And I think that I think that's the best thing. <laughs> and I think that you're right, because it's like whenever I think about New Zealand, I think about a wine. I think about Sauvignon Blanc. If it's not a Sauvignon Blanc, I think about a Pinot Noir. But here you are saying that you're going to grow Pinot Gris, um, Verge Chaminer, like Alsace blend, a blend. So like I would never even put those grapes in the same realm as New Zealand when I think about the wine. So I'm super glad that you're, you're telling me there's yeah. more out there. 
And if you, if you follow the, the, the one critiques, you would also see that New Zealand produces some of the top Chardonnays for years now. Uh, just coming here in Nelson, which is another three kilometers away from me, and we, uh, the likes of, um, um, oh, what's his name? I forget his name now. He's been winning uh, Decant Wine Awards with his, their Chardonnay for years consecutive. But if you want to buy that bottle of wine when you're in South Africa, that is about 50 US, New Zealand dollars up here. That's about 500 rand. Wow. That's quite a lot of money for a bottle of wine in South Africa. Yeah. So these wines, they never... It's actually 50 rand if it's 50 yeah. dollars, yeah. And I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> and that's a lot of money. And so... Uh, it doesn't make any business logic to be exporting those wines to South Africa. Mm -hmm. So uh, they just end up staying here. We make some great uh, Bordeaux blends in Hawke's Bay, in North Island. You didn't even know that place. We make some papery, beautiful Rhone style wines um, in, uh, um, in Hawke's Bay as well, up there. And the Shiraz is just amazing there. And, but we never, they never leave the country. So wow. New Zealand wines, are, they are better discovered when you are here than, um, so we got some hidden gems. So I think we are special in that sense. I can't wait to visit. That is on my <laughs> list right now. That's on my list. I'm telling you, I am bringing the entire Zuri wine tribe. We're going to go have a winemaker's dinner with Kashias and yep. we are going to drink his wine, gumbo and good, all the varietals. I cannot wait. So, okay, let's oh, wait. We, we can't wait. We can't wait. We can't wait to have you too. And, um, at, um, and also to top that, we're the only country in New Zealand with no COVID-19. Can you believe it? In, 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 the, world. in the world. In the world. I know. So I feel like it'll be a long time before they let people like me in. I have, I'm from the yeah. US, plus I live in South Africa. And they're probably like, no, you're on both lists. You can't come. You no, know, you, 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 South Africa, UK, and America are already on the list from last night. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like on, I'm like two out of three of the countries that you, people don't want to visit. Um, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. But that is so yeah. good. One more question. Is it harvest season right now? So I think you guys have the same art. It's coming up. Is it, do you guys harvest like it, it, February to March or so? Yeah, from, uh, from March. We're starting March in Marlboro. So it's interesting how the harvest season happens in New Zealand. We already looking at the coming three, four weeks harvest in uh, Wax Bay in North Island. And uh, it moves from the north going south. It's amazing. And you, wait, and it you really takes that. that long. So wait, when does it start? So like in Hawks Bay, like when do you think the first grapes will be picked? In three yes, so beginning of beginning of beginning of March. No, no, wait. Beginning of yeah. March. Are you serious? Beginning of March. I'm serious. At the moment, they, wow. because this is when we expect we have got fruit already. This is when we expect our hottest days. So wow. they're starting to pick up now. And then we go to Marlborough around mid-March to mid beginning of April. We're coming to Waipra around the beginning of April. Around the 10th of um, April, we will be down south in Central Otago. That's how it works. It's just like a chain. Oh, wow. So, you know what? I love <laughs> it. So I'm going to keep that in mind, too. So for like 2022, yeah. I can do harvest in South Africa starting in January. Then I can yeah. leave here in like March and I can go to New Zealand and I can just follow the harvest trail there. And then I can yeah. go back to America and I can do the harvest season in America in August, August, September. Oh, my goodness. I never thought about yeah. like three harvest seasons in, in this one year. Yeah, you can do you can do the trail because that's what that's how we cut the cost as well. We bring harvesters from these countries and they start from North Island. As they finish, they keep on going down. They all end up in Central Otago. And oh if you ask God. them after the harvest, they will tell you they came two months ago. They started in North Island. That is just, so, that's <laughs> such a fun fact that I just learned about New Zealand. I'm super excited about that, and I definitely want to yeah. do that whole harvest train, harvest trail thing. Go from the north to the south island. <laughs> yeah, but, absolutely. And we got an American, um, uh, young uh, black American winemaker in in Hawkes Bay. I'll tell you. I'll email you your details. She is incredible. Do you know her? Okay, you need to connect me to her. If you know her personally, you need to introduce me to her because I, I just got an email or a Facebook post. Somebody tagged me. I can't remember her name. But yeah, I did yeah, I her out and I do want to meet her. 
Yeah, yeah, she's she's incredible. She's making some fantastic wines. She's been uh, she had had a chance to work with some uh, big producers in New Zealand. Um, I think we're friends on Facebook. I we chat sometimes, but yeah, she's American. She's a black wine maker in New Zealand, so it's makes up the two of us. So you know, I do this wine festival every year. It used to be called Wine Over LA, and I used to have like black winemakers that were from America, like all over America. But now I think my next Wine Over LA is just literally going to be wine all over the world and um, black winemakers yeah. all over the world. So I'm super cool to be able to have somebody from New Zealand on there, like two people from New Zealand now, because I'm going to reach out to her. I got to get her name. Oh um, yeah, and then South Africa and France and everywhere. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's interesting. So yeah, I think we yeah we we would love um we would I would I would introduce you to you and um I would love that if you've got some contacts in the USA as well when the borders open I would like to see Gamble and Good um exporting to the USA. So um, if you've got any uh, importers, I can tap no. on the shoulder. We can yeah. put the word out, and then what I like to do is introduce you to like an importer exporter. Hopefully, that relationship works out. But then once you get in yeah. the states, I just rally all my folks. I rally all my people who have licenses to distribute. Say, go buy this wine, and then tell yeah. all my folks to just go out and buy it. Um, I know yeah, yeah. Tanache is having great success there in the United States right now, so I'm super proud of yeah. him. And my goal yeah. is to get all of us to get that American yeah. money. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. That would be that would be fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me. This has been absolutely amazing. I love it. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Have a good night. Yeah. You too. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. -bye.